It is such a pleasure to be back and see all of you. Uh, many of you uh, I've known over the years and haven't seen you for a while. It's a pleasure to uh, be in your presence and celebrate uh, the goodness of our Lord together this morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, please turn with me to uh, John chapter 11. It's a familiar passage. Uh, you know, I, I've, no, I've heard probably 100 sermons on John 11. I thought I really understood uh, John 11. And one of the things that happens when you go through like deep trials <laughs> is you understand passages that are familiar to you in a totally different way. And this is one of those amazing passages. John chapter 11, beginning at verse, uh, verse 1. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, so when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to the disciples, let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and you're going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. After saying these things, he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to awaken him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death. But they thought that he meant taking rest in sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas, called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, Let us go also, that we may die with him. Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. When she said these things, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, The teacher is here, and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now, when Mary came to the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. 
Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The man who had died, came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, and his face wrapped with cloth. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Thus far the reading of God's word. You know, we, we all believe in providence. We believe that God is in, in control intellectually, right? We hold on to that, that belief, but sometimes in the face of suffering, not only our own suffering, but sometimes especially the suffering of loved ones, we question that. We wonder, why so much suffering? Why does God's providence include so much suffering in the world? Why does he let, especially his people, go through so much trouble? Why is this world for so many a veil of tears. And we know that we don't know the backstory. We get that in the book of Job, right? The beginning of the book of Job, Job didn't know. <laughs> he didn't know about that conversation between uh, the sovereign God and the fallen angel. Have you considered my servant Job was not an invitation to taunt and torture Job. Rather, it was so that he might believe. It's the, like the, the situation in Genesis 50. Remember when Joseph's brothers come to him during the famine, and he's now the prime minister, the one they had thrown into a pit to die, has become the prime minister. Now they come to him, depending on him to keep them alive. And Joseph says, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good, to save all these people alive this very day. You see, even in the same event, the devil has one purpose, and, and evil people, perhaps sometimes, and God has a different purpose in the same event. God always means it for good, and that's why we... We can, indeed, all things must work together for our salvation. I love that. Not all things, just all things happen to work together. All things must work together for our salvation. You see, God's glory and our good are not opposites. It's not like a seesaw. The more God is glorified, you know, the less happy we are. <laughs> right? The less fulfilled. No, God's glory is to save. To save from deep troubles. But the problem is we don't know the backstory. And the whole book of Job, of course, I'm not going to, you'll be glad to know, I'm not going to be exegeting the whole book of Job uh, this morning, but uh, the whole book really is about what happens when you don't know the backstory, right? Not just Job, but his friends. And usually when you don't know the backstory and you're going through suffering, you become a Hindu. You know? In other words, you believe in karma. Everybody believes in karma. You get what's, what you give out, right? That's even in the Bible. We heard it in, from Ezekiel this morning. Uh, according to the strict standard of the law, you will be judged if you do injustice. Right? If you jump off a 20-story building, you will not break the law of gravity. The law of gravity will break you. Or you'll break yourself against it. That's just the way the world works. There is such a thing as karma. God built it into creation. These are the laws of creation, let's call it, instead of karma. The laws of creation. You can't break them with, without breaking yourself against them. And so Job's friends are saying, well, obviously, Job, if you're suffering, you're not living in God's perfect will. You must have at some point stepped outside of his perfect will for your life. If you just kind of 
cough it up and maybe surrender all, uh, we'll, we, we can get this right and you won't suffer anymore. It'll be, you'll be more prosperous than you were before. But the real purpose of Job's suffering was not karma. The purpose of his suffering, we learn in that great climax of the book of Job, is I know that my Redeemer lives. And he will stand upon this earth and with my own eyes and in my own flesh that is falling apart right now, I will see him face to face. Was that worth all the suffering he went through to come to that existential point of a personal relationship with Almighty God? Absolutely it was. You come to John chapter 9. Everything in the Gospel of John is that you may believe. That you may believe. That you may believe. It's it's on, on every page practically. The whole purpose of the Gospel, that you may believe. And believing, have life in his name. And you get to chapter 9 and you get a Job kind of moment there, right? Where Jesus heals the man born blind from his youth. Before he heals him, the disciples ask Master, was this man born blind because of his sins or because of the sins of his parents? And Jesus said, neither. (laughs) But for this very moment, so that God may be glorified, the Son of Man may be seen as glorious before you this day. God had one purpose. Satan has a different purpose. But even in the same event, God's purpose always wins. And that's why all things must work together for our salvation. And we see that, we see that very clearly in this passage. Uh, it begins, first of all, with an apparent contradiction, doesn't it? It's a little, a little strange here, uh, and it's meant to be. It's meant to jar us. Uh, for, first of all, he, he says, uh, lo, uh, notice, Lazarus of Bethany. Talk about Lazarus of Bethany. This is not just God loving in general. God always loves people in particular. Lazarus of Bethany gets in the New Testament. Not just as a man or a friend of Jesus, one of his buddies he hung out with, but Lazarus and from, from Bethany. That particular Lazarus, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God calls people by name. Lord, he whom you love is ill. He whom you love, that individual, Lazarus of Bethany, he whom you love is ill. And the assumption was Jesus would come running. Had they not seen Jesus heal so many people he never met before? Even even a a woman who happened to touch him and he said, "Who, who are you who touched me? People were healed all the time around Jesus. So surely he would come running when Lazarus, whom he loves, is ill to the point of death. When Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. It is for the glory of God so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Okay, that's the first step of confusion when you don't know the backstory, right? What do you mean this illness does not lead to death? Okay, well, then he's not going to die, I guess. That's what Jesus means. Uh, it's for the glory of God, so the Son of God may be glorified through it. I'm not sure at all what that means. If they're, they're thinking, you know, as we go along here. But nobody but Jesus knew the backstory. Jesus knew what he was about to do. They didn't. From their perspective, it all made sense. The, 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 the confusion made sense. And so we read, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Okay, yeah. We've, this is really being emphasized. Jesus loved them too. Jesus loved them particularly. Jesus loved Lazarus. Jesus loved Martha. And Jesus loved Mary. So he came running. 
No. So, when he heard Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Doesn't it get weirder and weirder? Do you ever feel like that when you're in the middle of suffering? <laughs> it gets, gets weirder and weirder. So why does, why does God not act now? Why isn't he doing what I thought he would do? We're all prosperity gospel people, you know, deep, deep down. Why isn't he doing what I tell him to do? Lazarus has died, Jesus said. And for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there so that you may believe. You can imagine the disciples saying, that doesn't help me. We're not getting any clearer here. Uh, I need to understand what's happening because you just said you loved them so much and you love the disciples so much that instead of coming to Lazarus on his deathbed running, you stayed for two more days where you were. And now you're telling us, the disciples say, that you're glad he died for our sakes so that we may believe. Believe what? That he died? But now let's go to him, Jesus says. <laughs> Now's the right time. When's the right time? Well, God decides when the right time. Now's the right time to go to Lazarus after he's died. Total confusion. Thomas is, it, usually when Thomas is confused, he's sarcastic. He's got this kind of knee-jerk impulse of, you know, Peter is, is like Rambo, says all kinds of stupid stuff as a kind of bravado thing. But Thomas is usually the kind of snarky guy in the background uh, who, who, you know, oh, okay, well, you know, we were just in Jerusalem and that didn't go very well. Uh, you were almost killed. So by all means, let's go back so we can die with him. He's been dead for four days. By the way, he didn't pass on or pass away. Jesus said he's dead. Jews let people die. You know, Christians used to let people die. Now, especially in California, we don't let anybody die. They just pass away. But, you know, if you don't die, you can't be, risen. You can't be raised. You won't live again. You just pass away like into ether, like a gas or something, and maybe visit on Thanksgiving in the kind of corner of the dining room or something. Uh, that's pagan. That's not, that's not biblical. No, he's dead. He's really dead. Jesus waited until he really died so that he could really raise him. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. By the way, nobody, I think, is to be blamed for their responses in this whole episode. And we have to be careful not to blame people when they're going through confusing times of suffering. Uh, don't get the backstory. When you don't get the backstory, that makes sense. Lord, you love him, you love me, you love my sister. If you had been here, he wouldn't have died. But notice what immediately follows. But, even now... I'm going to register my disappointment, but also my faith. Even now I know. God gives you whatever you ask for. Now what's interesting here is at this point in Jesus' revelation of, of his person, it makes sense that Martha is thinking of him as a great prophet. Perhaps the greatest prophet who ever lived. You have such a close relationship with God that anything you ask him for, he gives to you. But Jesus isn't just a prophet, is he? Jesus is God. And so he's trying to push Martha out of the shadows from simply acknowledging a doctrinal point, and I believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting, 
to actually recognizing him as who he is. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, well, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Not just abstractly in the resurrection of the dead at the end of the age, but do you believe in me as the resurrection and the life? Resurrection happens whenever I'm around. <laughs> Not just on the last day, but whenever I bring the last day into the present. Do you believe this? And she said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. That's what this was about. The backstory has now become front page. Now we see why Jesus said, and for your sakes, I was glad he died so that you might believe. Didn't know that before. But now not only Martha, but all of the people around, in, including Jews who had come from Jerusalem to help, uh, uh, help console them, they heard this. They, they, they were about to see the glory of God, and they heard Jesus moving out of the stands in, onto the stage, off the sidelines into the game. Not just, I believe in the resurrection, but I believe you are, you are the resurrection and the life. You are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. You see, I, uh, really, I think of this passage as the resurrection of Martha. More than the resurrection, not just the resurrection of Lazarus, the resurrection of Martha, and of Mary, and of Lazarus, and of all the people standing around, and of the disciples who heard him say this and believed. There's something bigger going on here than whether we're suffering or not. And that suffering, not to diminish it at all, but that suffering often is the very means, though Satan means it for evil, the very means that God turns around and bends back for his good purposes. And then he gets it. Jesus gets it. Deeply moved. He came to the tomb. As soon as, as, soon as uh, Mary came out weeping, and then all the people with her who were consoled, they started, they started weeping. Jesus broke down. And he knows he's going to raise Lazarus in five minutes. That's what's so astonishing. He knew the backstory. He knew exactly what he was about to do. But he broke down crying because death is that bad. You can't put a silver lining on it. You can't just wave it away and say, well, all's well that ends well. Jesus was about to raise him, but that didn't make death, the last enemy, any more horrifying. And Jesus looked straight into, his, into the face of death and deeply moved. In his spirit, he was greatly troubled. It's a typical uh, English way of uh, putting it. In, in the Greek, the verbs here are snorted like a horse, uh, uh, cried out in a loud voice. This is, if you've ever seen a Near Eastern funeral, even on television, you know what I'm talking about? P people falling all over the casket uh, during the procession. Uh, that's what is going on here at the tomb. Jesus lost it. In his human nature, he just, he crumbled emotionally in the face of death. And that's not wrong because he's our sinless savior. And then, 
Again, Jesus, deeply moved, came to the tomb and said, take away the stone. It's the third time we're told that he was deeply moved. The third time. This is meant to be emphasized. Deeply moved. He said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around, that they may believe that you sent me. And then he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. This is the same voice that said, let there be light. And there was light. I am the resurrection and the life. I don't just have a great relationship with God. I am God. I turn the lights on when there's only darkness. Unbind him and let him go. Now, Lazarus would die again. Unfortunately, he would have to go through all that all over again. He would have a funeral again. Other people would, you know, would come and, and mourn. But then it would be on this side of Jesus' resurrection, which meant the first fruits of the resurrection had begun. The resurrection, not resurrection for a little while, completely new life, glorification had begun with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's not just a doctrine we assent to. Yes, of course, I believe in the resurrection on the last day. Yes, I believe that I'll see my brother, my sister, my spouse, my mother or father in heaven one day and we'll be raised. Yes, I believe that. But do you, this morning, do you believe this? Jesus is your resurrection and your life. It's not about Lazarus because it's for Lazarus. It's not about you, what you've done, your suffering, getting karma, or if you don't suffer as much because you're a fairly good person. It's that you might believe. Ultimately, all things must work together for your salvation. Do you believe this? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us your only begotten Son so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Our Father, help us to move out of the stands where we always feel comfortable, the sidelines where... We can be at arm's length from you, especially in times of suffering when we think that, you know, we'd just like you to turn your face away from us. Thank you for not turning your face away. Thank you for giving us both the opportunity and the faith itself to embrace our Savior who is the resurrection and the life. May this be a comfort for us in life and death, body and soul, here and in the hereafter, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.